Hey, what's going on, you guys? It's Aces High, and today we're starting our whole Roman Julius Caesar kind of uh, hodgepodge, you know, just series. It's going to be a long one. It is. I, I think uh, this playlist works out to like 25 videos or something, so get ready for like the next month. That being said, uh, I, I can't thank you guys enough for suggesting this seriously. Several of you brought it up. Uh, specifically, again, one of my first subscribers, LightX7, mentioned it several times and highly recommended uh, the one by Historia Civilis. Uh, and then I actually had a, uh, a viewer, Sebastian Bolzen, Bolzen, something like that, B-O-L-Z-A-N. Uh, he actually put together a playlist that he recommended, and I took a look at it, and I liked it for the most part, and uh, it's, it's kind of going to be a, uh, a guide for me, so I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, what this playlist will do is it kind of works through Rome uh, from the start all the way up through like Caesar and his assassination, then what happened afterwards. I think it even gets into Augustus a little bit and all that, so uh, I'm really excited for it. Anyway, uh, today we are starting the first video. Uh, it's titled The Roman uh, Pomerium, Roman Panarium, something like that. Uh, anyway, and uh, all these videos are going to be by Historia Civilis. Uh, they're an awesome channel. Go check them out if you haven't already. I do have a link in the description. Hope you guys like it, and uh, I guess make sure you sub, help me out. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's get started. According to legend, Rome was founded on a murder. Oh, that's right. No, I know this. From the video we watched, what, two days ago? Wasn't it two brothers, uh, what, Romulus or something? I guess that's a Star Trek thing. Uh, and whatever the hell his brother's name were, and, and the one that's, uh, I think it was Romulus, dot, uh, killed his brother, so that's why it's Rome or something like that, short for his name. The dispute arose between two twin brothers, Romulus oh, and Remus, when they led an expedition to found a new city next to the Tiber River. The brothers agreed that the ideal location for this new city would be somewhere on this set of hills, but they couldn't exactly agree on where to begin construction. One brother, Romulus, was primarily interested in the military defense of the city, and therefore favored a centrally located hill called the Palatine. The other brother, Remus, was thinking of trade and commerce, and so favored a hill that enjoyed easy access to the river, called the Aventine. This disagreement set off a full-scale 10 out of 10 argument. The group accompanying the brothers split right down the middle, until there was a Palatine faction under Romulus and an Aventine faction under Remus. There was no possibility of reaching a consensus, so each side agreed to go to their preferred hill, make some animal sacrifices, and await a sign from the gods. Remus and friends on the Aventine Hill soon saw six vultures flying overhead. The brothers claimed to be descended from Mars, god of war, and for obvious reasons, the vulture was his bird, so this made a lot of sense. Clearly, this was the sign they were waiting for. Remus marched over and informed his brother that his hill had received a favorable sign from the gods. Romulus responded, saying that just now, 12 vultures had landed on his hill. Remus was like, you're a damn liar. <laughs> oh yeah, I, you have six vultures? Well, I have 12. <laughs> ...and insisted on seeing the vultures for himself. Remus was not satisfied by this. Sure, he argued, the gods had shown each brother a sign, but Remus's sign had appeared first, which must mean that the gods slightly favored his plan. Romulus was not having this. He argued that 12 vultures was obviously better than 6 vultures, and besides, they had actually landed on his hill, which must mean that that's where they were supposed to set down roots. The argument escalated until each brother gave up and went back to their own camp. Romulus was like to hell with this and began construction on the Palatine Hill. Job number one was digging a trench which would later serve as the base for the city's walls. When Remus saw this, he and his supporters marched right over to the Palatine Hill. They may have brought weapons. Remus and company angrily crossed Romulus's little trench, and words were exchanged. Before too long, a fight broke out. When the dust settled, 
Remus was dead. According to tradition, Romulus struck the killing blow. Huh. Romulus would go on to build his city on the Palatine Hill, naming it Roma, or Rome, after himself. I guess if Remus had won, it would be Rima. Something like that, Reem. How much of this actually happened? Maybe some of it, maybe none of it, but the important thing is that later generations of Romans fully integrated this story into their own mythology. But this is all kinda tangentially related to what I really want to talk about today. It may seem like a minor detail, but that trench dug by Romulus would go on to become one of the cornerstones of the Roman legal system. That trench is known as the Pomerium. The Latin word for city is urbe, or urbis, which itself is an oh. offshoot of the word orbis, meaning... Yo, is that where the word urban comes from then? I, I can only assume it's a base, you know? Circle. So why was the word city related to the word circle? In a legal sense, anything inside of a city's pomerium was the actual city, and anything outside the pomerium was something else. To be clear, hmm. most cities on the Italian peninsula would have had something resembling a pomerium, but for obvious reasons, Rome's was the most important by far. Over the centuries, Rome would grow beyond the Palatine Hill, and would go on to occupy all seven hills of Rome, and then some. A few early rulers tried to accommodate this by expanding the pomerium, but it was impossible to keep up with the city's growth. Eventually, reality set in, and people just accepted that in a legal sense, Rome's city limits were somewhere in the middle of a much larger, unofficial city. As this happened, the original walls of the Pomerium became less and less important, and over the centuries, they gradually faded away. The Pomerium eventually came to look like an open gap in between the buildings, with some ceremonial stone pillars to mark its place. Oh, more or cool. less, an invisible line. Well known to the locals, but easy for the untrained eye to miss. I wonder if, uh, like nowadays, inside of the Pomerium, the original one, I wonder if it's just historical buildings in there, or if it's really ritzy buildings, like really rich buildings, or... He'll probably tell me, but... Entering the Pomerium was a highly ritualized experience, all tied up in the law and in Roman religious belief. The hyper-legalistic Romans felt that it was important to invent a legal justification for Remus's murder by arguing that any breach in the Pomerium, including literally just walking across the invisible line, represented a symbolic breach in Rome's defenses. As such, crossing the Pomerium was a death penalty offense. If this is true, how did people get into the Pomerium? If you yeah. want to get super technical, the Pomerium stopped and then started again at a series of designated gates. According to Roman religious thinking, these specific gates were extremely important, since they had been sanctioned by the gods way back in the time of Romulus. This fact became kind of absurd after the actual walls of the Pomerium faded away. Plutarch recounts the story of Pompey trying and failing to fit a group of elephants through one of these designated gates, even though the land to either side of the gate was completely open. It never even occurred to anybody to take two steps to the left and walk across that invisible line. <laughs> That's how seriously the Romans took the Pomerium. Really? In fact, in every meaningful sense, the Pomerium dominated political life. Rome's highest elected officials, namely consuls and praetors, were basically expected to carry out the day-to-day -day governance of Rome from within the Pomerium. You know, legislation, administration, court cases, religious rights, all that exciting stuff. Here, just as you would expect, elected officials were constrained by the laws of Rome, just like any other citizen. However, once consuls or praetors left the Pomerium, they were technically considered on military campaign, and as such wielded absolute power over life and death. Therefore, you can think of the Pomerium as the invisible line that separated the military world from the civic world. 
This role switching of Rome's elected officials was embodied in the behavior of their lictors, which were groups of six or twelve bodyguards that followed consuls and praetors around for the duration of their term. They really had that many bodyguards? I understand, like, for instance, our president has secret service. He can have dozens at, uh, at that point, uh, like, when they're out and about, or, or maybe even more, but... Uh, I don't know, it just seems like a lot. Like, uh, our U.S. senators don't have that many bodyguards. A couple of them have one or two bodyguards, but for the most part, they don't have any. Inside the pomerium, lictors carried a ceremonial bundle of sticks. Once they left the pomerium, they added an axe to the mix, which advertised to the world the consul or praetor's expanded powers. In fact, there was probably an elaborate religious ceremony each time an elected official crossed the pomerium, but the details of this are lost to us. You would think that this whole thing would lead to an abuse of power, but it really didn't. The Senate was usually within the pomerium. Most government buildings were within the pomerium. Most rich people lived and worked within the pomerium. Plus, okay. any decision was subject to a court challenge once they were out of office. In this context, the power available to consuls and preachers outside the pomerium was pretty useful in a crisis, but didn't factor into normal domestic politics very much. When it came to governors and generals, which the Romans called proconsuls and propraetors, the effect of the pomerium became even more pronounced. When proconsuls or propraetors crossed the pomerium, all of their legal command authority evaporated, instantly transforming them back into private citizens. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the Senate would need an active general to be present at one of their meetings, which presented a bit of a problem. When this happened, the Senate would sometimes agree to make the trek out of the pomerium and hold an ad hoc meeting in some kind of public building, like a temple. Huh. This became a big issue in the late 50s BCE, during the lead-up to the Roman Civil War between Caesar and Pompey, at which time Pompey was technically an active general. This resulted in a remarkable amount of ping-ponging around two different temples and theaters outside the pomerium, which I'm sure was annoying to a bunch of grumpy old senators. Another problem related to this was that in order to stand for office, people were required to enter the pomerium and declare their candidacy in person. If a prospective candidate was an active general, or even worse, an active general posted to the other side of the continent, their only option was to leave their post early and cross the pomerium, relinquishing their command. This wow. tension between... So it probably didn't happen too often. I mean, that's a lot to give up, and it's a lot to, uh, to just do. You have to cross the entire damn country, you know? Standing for election and retaining one's command should be familiar to anybody watching this. Again, going back to the Roman Civil War, one of the central questions leading up to it was, what will happen to Caesar when he crosses the Pomerium? when it became clear that the likeliest result of giving up his command would be banishment or death, he didn't, which resulted in a civil war. However, and here comes the dumbest sentence I've ever written, civil wars were the exception and not the rule. This same rule, stripping generals of their command when they crossed into the pomerium, also applied to regular soldiers. Strictly really? speaking, there were not supposed to be soldiers on the Italian peninsula at all, but sometimes this was unavoidable, and in cases like this, it was useful for everybody to know that entering the pomerium for any reason would mean the end of their military career. Taken as a whole, this law basically made it impossible for any army to enter the pomerium. Or, to put it another way, no individual crossing the pomerium could claim to be acting on behalf of the Roman state. As we know, violating the pomerium was considered a symbolic attack on the city itself, whether it came from a foreign invader or from a Roman soldier. Along these same lines, it may not surprise you to learn that weapons were forbidden within the pomerium. This was taken quite... That just seems so crazy, like this is all stuff I didn't know. You know, uh, 
so if you if you're a normal traveling whatever citizen something traveling person and you go to Rome you're not going to see a bunch of soldiers and things like that that's just something I always envisioned seriously when it came to swords but it wasn't that unusual for people to show up with clubs and daggers during riots or whatever which I assume is just because those things are easier to hide there were exceptions to this rule though during a national emergency, the Senate could appoint a dictator for a six-month term. Unlike every other Roman official, a dictator's decisions could not be vetoed. And more importantly for our purposes today, a dictator's command authority did not evaporate when they crossed the invisible line, giving wow. them unchecked power to order soldiers into the pomerium. As a symbol of this power, a dictator's lictors were allowed to keep their axes and behave as if they were on military campaign at all times. Citizens knew what this meant, and it was a shocking sight to see. Obviously, the dictatorship was a dangerous tool, and so it was sparingly used throughout Rome's history. A similar mechanism that was much more commonly used was the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, or the Final Act. With the final act, the Senate empowered the consuls to defend the Republic by any means necessary. Any means meant that they could ignore laws, including the laws of the Pomerium. This may seem like a subtle difference, but it's important in terms of the legal system. Under the dictatorship, Rome put the law in the hands of one individual. With it's interesting, because I was talking about this uh, in the comments with a few of you guys, and... Uh... Dictator a day, I think of like a tyrant, I think of somebody that has unlimited control and uh, not necessarily abuses their control, but will not give it up, things like that, it's for life, you know? And uh, pe people were telling me, just like this video is saying, it, it was originally a six month type of thing, and then and then Caesar, uh, what he, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was he uh, declared 10 years of dictator term. Or something like that and then later on dictator for life you know and that's uh, kind of when it became closer associated with what we would see as a dictator today um, it's just interesting how it's changed because I think the last video said dictator in Latin means the speaker or something like that absolutely no oversight under wow. the final act everything remained the same but the consuls could ignore certain laws if they needed to with the Senate providing oversight although and uh, l let me ask something. Um, I guess, God, this is going to sound rude, and I, I really don't mean it to sound rude. I, I swear to God, um, I don't know how, how else to say it. But uh, I, I like Queen Elizabeth II, uh, the Queen of England. I, I think it's a fantastic story. I think she's a wonderful woman. Um, all of that. Uh, that being said, a monarchy in general... Can you guys tell, I know it's different than a modern day dictator, but because it, it's like passed down through, through the royal family and everything. But I look at these things and I go absolute control of the law. Technically they have it, no oversight. So is, isn't it that she actually has power over, uh, the prime minister and everything? So wouldn't that be no oversight and a dic dictator can make up laws. So, oh, I guess the monarchy cannot make up laws, right? Can't she just approve? She has to approve all the laws. So I guess that's one big difference. And again, I'm not saying she's a dictator, nothing like that. It just, I was looking at these and it just kind of reminded me of a monarchy, you know? Um, but I guess it is, it is very different. Uh, again, I meant no, no harm or anything. I seriously, I didn't mean anything offensive. I promise. Well, the results may have looked similar. The final act was much less disruptive to the Roman legal system. Mm, okay. The most famous usage of the final act came in 63 BCE, when the Senate empowered the consuls to put down a conspiracy to overthrow the government by any means necessary. The consul Cicero captured five of the conspirators, and then, without a trial, condemned them to death and had them executed right there in the middle of the pomerium. Under the final act, Cicero was allowed to break the law wow. like this, but the entire incident was highly offensive to the Roman people, and he paid a high political price for it. Finally, let's talk about elections. 
This may be counterintuitive, but certain kinds of voting were actually forbidden within the pomerium. This rule had to do with the assembly of the centuries, the body that was responsible for empowering generals through the election of consuls and praetors. During these elections, citizens were divided into metaphorical military units, and these units voted together as a block. By now, it should be clear why this was a problem. We know that soldiers became private citizens when they crossed the pomerium, but how did that work for metaphorical soldiers? It was unclear. What about the consuls overseeing the election? Holding an election with a bunch of metaphorical military units was a little bit like commanding one big metaphorical army, right? Yeah, true. If so, was that allowed within the pomerium? Legally, this was one big gray area. In order to avoid these tough questions, on every election day, a big chunk of Rome's population stopped what they were doing and exited the pomerium, making their way to the Campus Martius, or the Field of Mars, which was a relatively empty piece of land outside the pomerium that was deliberately set aside for military activities, both real and metaphorical. The only way to cross the pomerium was through one of the designated gates, and on election day, this turned a 20-minute walk into an all-day ordeal. Rich people could get around this by exiting the pomerium early and staying in one of their villas near the campus marshes, but for everybody else, this was a real disincentive to vote. Makes sense. You have to so, wait forever. So, broadly speaking, we can say that the pomerium was the legal mechanism that separated Rome's military from Rome's government. For centuries, this law kept the peace, and stopped ambitious generals from entering the city at the head of an army. That is, save for one enormous exception. The Roman Triumph. Oh shoot, is that it? It is, it is. Alright you guys, that's the uh, end of that one. Um, it's interesting, you know, so the Pomerium uh, being the wall, it just they had so many rules that they highly respected, you know. Uh, it just, I don't know, not being a Roman at the time, I'm sitting here going, we'll just walk around the damn wall. But uh, I mean, big time rules against it, death penalty, all that stuff, they took it very, very serious um, by the sounds of it, you know. Uh, anyway, Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we have a lot more, and uh, this is just kind of the start of Rome. Uh, Till next time, this is Ace Asai, and I'm out.